All right, so I wanted to do a number of things here. I want to talk about Daniel 9.27, and I want to see, first of all, uh, whether or not it can have anything to do with the recent Abraham Accords. These are the various peace uh, deals that were signed between Israel and some of its Arab neighbors, like uh, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and a few others to be added. I think another one was added recently. But anyway, we'll talk a little bit about the Abraham Accords. But the real question is, does any of that have to do... Is that the in part or in total fulfillment of this first part of Daniel 9.27, part of the famous 70 weeks prophecy where it says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and, and the oblation to cease, um, etc. So is is this confirming the covenant with many for one week, which we expect the Antichrist to do, is that in part or in, in total being fulfilled in the Abraham Accords? So that's question number one. I will say right at the outset that I am going to land on that question pretty much no. I'm going to suggest there is it is highly unlikely, but I am going to leave the door open to it, and I'll discuss why. And I will give you some rock-solid ways to tell if it is. In other words, we're going to look at a lot of the context of these verses and look at a lot of what people have said about them that you may believe yourself. And you're going to probably come away from this saying, oh yeah, that is what the Bible says. It doesn't say this thing and that thing. And so you're probably going to agree that it's almost certainly not being fulfilled with the Abraham Accords. However, there is a possibility that it is, and I wouldn't be a good watchman to, if I said, oh, it uh, certainly can't be. I would, I would say that is a possible interpretation of this passage. But if it is, we should see some radical things happening in the next few months and weeks and years, uh, specific, unavoidable things that if they don't happen, we can be absolutely sure this is not uh, the Abraham Accords that is, has nothing to do whatsoever with Daniel 9.27. The second part of this is I'm going to show you what Daniel 9.27 almost certainly is talking about, and then we're going to look at some passages I've just found recently that I think uh, show a good picture of what the fulfillment of Daniel 9.27 will look like when it happens. Okay, so that is a lot to cover. I should say that I also, well, let's just jump right in. So let's start with Daniel 9.27. We, we read the passage. Um, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And this has been, and I also agree that this is to be interpreted as the Antichrist making this or confer, this confirming a covenant with many, and that in the and that week means a week of seven years. It's a long story, but basically everybody agrees week here means seven years. And then in the middle of that week, therefore, means in the middle of that seven-year period, he will, what does he say, say that he will do? He will cause a sacrifice and oblation to cease. That's very important. We'll talk about that in a minute. So that's what happens in the middle of that, the three and a half years into that seven-year period. So really, I want to first say that we have very little information about this event. And it's an important event because as followers of uh, Bible prophecy will know, and I have here some of the main positions about the final seven-year period, what I'll call the 70th week of Daniel. These are all seven-year periods viewed from the pre-trib position, the mid-trib, the post-trib, and the pre-wrath position. All of these are uh, their view of that seven-year period. The, the most important thing to realize here is that the beginning of this seven-year period in every single view begins with the covenant that is made with the Antichrist here. This this thing happening in Daniel 9.27 kicks off this final seven-year period. So that's going to be important as we progress, uh, but I do want you to kind of get your bearings as to what we're talking about and why this moment in time of Daniel 9.27 is so important. We're going to get really into the weeds here with these two verses later. Okay, so the other thing that I need to talk about, I guess, before I get to the Abraham Accords is why this verse in Daniel 9.27 has been understood to be a peace agreement. Now, that's it doesn't jump right out at you, you know, reading this. You know, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. In the middle of the week, he shall cause sacrifice and oblation to cease. That doesn't say, and he shall make a peace agreement with Israel 
Um, and in the middle of that uh, peace agreement, uh, seven years, he's going to break the peace agreement. That, that's a lot of reading into that. And I, I want everybody to be clear that while that could be what's happening here, that line, I feel like many Christians, including myself for many years, I'd been told that since I was, the first I ever learned about Bible prophecy was probably one of these, it was Hal Lindsey almost certainly, that said, that's what I was to look for in the end times, that the Antichrist would make a peace agreement with Israel that would be for seven years, but in the middle of that seven-year period, he would break it. Um, and that view, while the characters, you know, who, was it going to be a Roman Antichrist or an Islamic Antichrist or a Russian or a, well, had, all that stuff has changed over the years. But that one idea that we're all supposed to be looking for a seven year peace agreement with Israel that in the middle of that peace agreement was broke. And because I feel like, and again, I'm not, I'm not going to say that that's not what's going to happen. I am going to say that's probably not what the Bible is talking about. But that is a possible interpretation of this. And so therefore, we need to be uh, good watchmen and make sure we are covering that idea. So uh, just wanted to point that out, that for the most part, this peace agreement that we're looking for is not in the Bible. Some people will say that 1 Thessalonians 5 is where we get the peace agreement from. You'll say, ah, Chris, but what about 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, which says, for when they say peace and safety... Then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So this is where the, the, the uh, concept of, yes, he says covenant in Daniel 9.27, but what he really means is peace deal because of 1 Thessalonians 5.3, when they say peace and safety. So this is supposed to be equated with Daniel 9.27 in that view. This saying peace and safety is, is the people that are being deceived by the Antichrist in that view. Now, the problem with that, especially for the pre-tribulationalist, uh, that those that believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, this is an incredibly bad way to interpret this. And the reason is because of the verse before it, which says, you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now, this idea about the, the, the thief in the night uh, not being aware, and thus and therefore the day of the Lord coming upon him, uh, is a, a theme that you see in the Olivet Discourse and other places. But what I'm trying to say is that when they say peace and safety, then, then sudden destruction, that sudden destruction is the day of the Lord in context. Let's read it again. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. We know that the sudden destruction in context is the day of the Lord. What's the problem with that, you might ask? Well, let's go back to our uh, little chart here and let's focus in on the pre-trib position. The pre-trib position believes that the entire seven-year period is the day of the Lord. The very first event uh, in this seven-year period is the rapture, and then the day of the Lord begins immediately afterwards. There are almost no pre-tribulationalists that deviate from the concept that the entire seven-year period is the day of the Lord. Now, what's the problem then? Well, let's go back to our verse. These people are saying peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. So the people saying peace and safety, which we know is the day of the Lord, they have to be saying peace and safety over here because the sudden destruction hasn't happened yet. They say peace and safety over here, then sudden destruction happens. Now, again, in context, what's supposed to be happening in Daniel 9.27? In Daniel 9.27, the first event that's supposed to happen is the Antichrist making this quote-unquote peace agreement, right? So if the first thing that happens is supposed to be him making the peace agreement, then what are these people over here in 1 Thessalonians uh, uh, five three doing saying peace and safety before the day of the Lord, before the Antichrist has made this peace agreement, because it's before the day of the Lord and it, it just doesn't work. I wanted to edit this in to answer a quick objection that some people might have. They might say, "What if the covenant or peace agreement that the Antichrist makes sort of initiates the day of the Lord?" 
In other words, in the pre-trib model, this very beginning moment that starts the seven-year period, a lot of things are happening. You've got the Antichrist making a covenant, you have the rapture happening there, and you have the beginning of the day of the Lord. So that first day is a pretty eventful one, right? The Antichrist makes a peace deal, there's a rapture, and the day of the Lord starts. Three things, big things happening in the pre-trib model. So what if people are saying peace and safety because the Antichrist announces the peace agreement. The peace agreement is being announced today, the beginning of the seven-year period. People are saying peace and safety. Then sudden destruction comes upon them. So the, the, the peace and safety in this, in this view, this objection, would really just be one day of saying peace and safety. They said peace and safety for whatever, if you want to pretend it's a couple days or whatever. But they just say peace and safety for a minute, and then sudden destruction comes upon them. That's the only possible way you could get out of this and still have 1 Thessalonians uh, 5 have anything to do with Daniel 9.27. But the problem with that is Daniel 9.27, which if you want to interpret the covenant as a peace agreement, remember the line is there that he breaks the peace agreement. Everything's fine for the first three and a half years, not one day. They say peace and safety over three and a half years. And then it, it's only at the midpoint that he quote unquote breaks the peace agreement with the abomination of desolation. So the peace and safety is a three and a half year situation, not a one second or one day or a couple day situation that inaugurates the day of the Lord. In other words, the pre-trib model, uh, because it has the day of the Lord of all seven uh, being all seven years, uh, doesn't make in this uh, uh, doesn't make allowance for the first three and a half years to be peace and safety. The, the day of the Lord would have to start at some point or right at the midpoint, actually. They'd have to be mid-tribbers in order for 1 Thessalonians 5 to make any sense. I know that is a little bit complicated, and perhaps the reason it's complicated is the reason nobody has explained that to you before. But I just want to point out that this verse, peace and safety, then sudden destruction, if the sudden destruction is the day of the Lord, which I don't think you can get around, if the sudden destruction is the day of the Lord, then the peace, of, the peace and safety cannot be the peace and safety in the pre-trib model created by the Antichrist's uh, quote-unquote peace agreement at the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel because that would be uh, the very moment in the pre-trib view that the day of the Lord starts. Okay, so I wanted to say that. So back in our verse, again, I want to point out that this concept of him confirming a covenant with many for one week in the midst of the week shall cause sacrifice and oblation to cease is therefore the only verse that we have of this, this so-called event that we're all looking for and saying the Abraham Accords is it. As if we have all this information about what this event's supposed to look like. But in reality, all we really have is a bunch of Hal Lindsey books that have told us that this event will look uh, like an Antichrist making a peace agreement with Israel in the middle of the... We have that, but what we have in reality is no verses except for Daniel 9.27. One admittedly vague verse that says, and he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause sacrifice and oblation to cease. So therefore, if that's true, we need to pay attention to this verse, and we need to try to mine it for any information we can to see what it is that's going to spark the beginning of this final 70th week of Daniel, because it's an important milestone as a watchman. It informs virtually everything that you are going to understand and watch for right? Okay. The Abraham Accords uh, were a series of peace deals made between Israel and some of its Arab neighbors. Um, these peace deals were, in to simplify it, and I could be oversimplifying it, is that a lot of Israel's Arab neighbors um, have, for various reasons, uh, probably religious reasons mostly, that is to say that the Quran is very uh, antagonistic towards Israel and therefore its people have, and therefore its government, who is beholden to its people, uh, are, have taken a political line that they are not to recognize Israel as a state. It shouldn't even exist, and therefore as a government, we should not even acknowledge that it exists in any kind of political way. And not acknowledging a, a, a geographic neighbor in a political way, has a lot of problems <laughs> with uh, just just day-to-day -day relations. So, for example, uh, you know, you can't, obviously can't traverse from one country to another if you can't have an official passport. 
uh, and you can't do that whole sort of process of getting your passport stamped. You can't just visit like it's nothing. Certainly, there are all kinds of um, economic and other deals that can occur. Basically, stuff we take for granted has not been done in the Middle East because of the unwillingness for many Arab countries to not recognize Israel as a state. The Abraham Accords, and what I will suggest is a very uh, uh, good diplomatic uh, uh, move. It was a smart move, and it could bear good fruit in the region in terms of of peace. It may or may not last. I don't know. I hope that it does uh, because it does it does put the Middle East on a path at least to possibly, uh, you know, obviously you, you now can open embassies and you can have official talks. I mean, there, there's agreement that these, they talked before, but it all had to be sort of underground. But now they can officially have embassies and actually have relations and a whole number of things can happen. And more countries are probably on the way. So depending on who you talk to, and I mean, on one, I think there's a little bit of extremes on both sides. One side will say, this is the greatest thing. It's going to change the world. It's, the, it's this big boon to the world. And then the other side is very down on it. They'll say, uh, it, not much has changed, and you know, it doesn't really do all that much. I mean, for all they're basically doing is admitting the country exists. But I think it's somewhere in the middle. I think it's, pretty, it's a pretty good deal, and I hope it goes somewhere. Now, from the cynical point of view, of course, if I believed this was the Antichrist, I would have to believe one of these characters involved was the Antichrist, uh, whether that be Trump or uh, uh, Jared Kushner or Benjamin Netanyahu or, I don't know, the guy, whoever the uh, uh, other people involved are. Um, and I've seen a lot of uh, people that are just so set on this being the uh, fulfillment of Daniel 927 that they're kind of stuck because they're, of course, you know, Trump supporters, so they don't want to have it be Trump. So they're left with either doing one or two things. They'll say it's Jared Kushner who seemed to broker a good portion of these uh, these uh, talks, or they will say that um, this isn't actually a fulfillment of Daniel 9:27. It's sort of like a uh, a precursor or something to that effect. It will it'll eventually culminate in in the in the peace deal. Uh, and I mean, that's just quite frankly nonsense. I mean, there's no indication that there's going to be precursors to Daniel 927 or prefigurations in history before it happens. That's just reading far, far too much in the scripture. I believe all in a hope to just have the newspapers have to do with Bible prophecy. You have to understand, and I don't mean to browbeat anybody with this, but it is sort of a pet peeve of mine, is that Christianity throughout its existence read every single writing from every generation of the church, and they all believed that they were in the end times, without exception. It doesn't matter who the big baddie of the day was, it was the Antichrist, and they were in the end times. And a lot of them had good reason to believe that. They were being killed and so on and so forth for the gospel. Um, but the, the sad thing is, is that the consistent thing is that they all they all would not budge in the fact that well we know that whatever hap is happening right now Genghis Khan is clearly the antichrist that's that's a given the question is how do we twist the scripture and allegorize it to make Genghis Khan the antichrist that's that's the the sad thing of all this is that i could say what i'm about to say here is that this may be i'll grant you that it could be the fulfillment of night in 27 but if it is, as we're about to look at, there must be the daily sacrifice, a twice daily sacrifice of oxen, sheep, and, and, and grain offerings offered twice a day on the Temple Mount must not only begin, but be stopped in, the in less than three and a half years. So we've got a lot to do in three and a half years if this is going to be it. But the people that will not budge from this, the, the, of all the most important thing to them is that whatever's happening must be the end times. They, where they will budge is the Bible. They'll say, ah, well, those sacrifices, you know, they're, they're, they'll spiritualize that and say, or, they're happening in our heart now, or some, they'll, they're, that's where they will give, and that's not where we give. We give on the newspaper side. We don't give on the Bible side. All right, so let me explain why I say that there must be the daily sacrifice that begins uh, uh, very, very soon if, in fact, uh, the Abraham Accords are the fulfillment of Daniel 9.27. And it's because of the construction of Daniel 9.27. Uh, 
It says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. So let's set aside what that means for now. Let's just assume for the sake of argument that that, that is um, the Abraham Accords or what have you. And in the midst of the week, or the middle of the week, um, th- he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Now, the sacrifice and oblation is no uh, um, not meant to be general at all. We can tell from other places in Daniel that this is a reference, and he, he goes into that in some detail here. It's a reference to a theme in Daniel, the abomination of desolation. And in Daniel, we learn that this future event, this abomination of desolation, is characterized by the ceasing of the daily sacrifice. The daily sacrifice is described in Exodus and lots of different places. It's very detailed sacrifice for the, for the atonement uh, of sins in the Jewish world. It is extremely important. It is probably the most important um, ritual in Judaism, and it cannot be underestimated. The fact that the daily sacrifice is not going on right now is explicit proof that uh, that true Judaism, as as described in the Mosaic Covenant, is not happening right now. Um, and this chapter, as I'll show in a minute, is all about that. This chapter is is almost exclusively about the temple, as it was what Daniel was praying about, actually, at the moment. We'll get into that. But why, what I really want to say here is that the way that this is constructed, it, it seems to suggest that whatever the confirming the covenant with many for one week is, it should be understood. You can look at this two ways. I say it should be understood to be the beginning of the implementation of the daily sacrifice because in the next line, it assumes that that's what you know happened. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Now, it says and here. Other generations have but. In fact, I think the vast majority of them say but, as if it's a contrast here. You shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and uh, for the half of a week you shall put it in. Well, I guess they don't They don't say here's a but, and, and a couple of them say uh, a but. I guess it's not a really important point. And either way, the secondary way to look at it is that no matter if the, the daily sacrifice had been going on before whatever happened at the beginning of the 70th week, Let's say this, it could be that they were going on long before the beginning of the 70th week and just were stopped at the midpoint. But I would suggest it seems much more likely that they began at the moment that the seven-year period started, and then in the middle of the week, he causes them to stop. In other words, the first part assumes that you know that the daily sacrifices are going uh, again, and then they stop. One way I think you can check your facts there is because of the previous verse. Uh, let's read the previous verse. It says, And the three score and two weeks shall the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself and the people of the prince that shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. So the destruction of the sanctuary specifically, the temple, if you will, and the end uh, thereof shall be with the flood, and to the end of the war desolations are determined. So this is widely understood to be the destruction of 70 AD with the Romans destroying Jerusalem. But it's interesting that Daniel 9.26 calls out specifically the city and the sanctuary, the temple, the, the temple mount, the fulfillment of Jesus, not one stone will be left upon another. The actual sanctuary will be uh, gone. And it begins, if you will, it starts up again 2,000 years later. There's a, you know, a big gap between the first 69 weeks of Daniel and this last seven-year period. And in between, there's been 2,000 years before it started up again. And I would suggest that what Daniel 9.27 is saying is that the reason that it started up again is the moment that, if you will, the the ribbon on the temple is cut and they begin to to offer sacrifice and oblation, in other words, the daily sacrifice again. Um, And that's when the clock starts again. I did a podcast that I released recently or just last week um, talking about a reference to this in my Daniel commentary about why I think that all Daniel 9.27 is about uh, temples. It's, a, it's all about temples. I call it, uh, uh, well, whatever I call it. Uh, this is why, and I think you can make the, even if you didn't believe a single word I said in that last podcast, I believe that just looking at Daniel 9.26 and 27 logically, you can assume that what Daniel 9.27 is talking about is 
is no uh, uh, two thousand years without a temple now begins with a temple, and this or whether a temple or or whatever, just the the sanctuary. I don't know, but I would submit probably a temple just for a couple things. I'll, I'll get into. But in any way, in any case, it's the ribbon cutting, I believe, is the best way to look at that, of the temple, the beginning of the sacrifices and offerings. And that's why it then begins to say, but in the middle of the week, the sacrifice and offerings will stop. Even though it didn't mention them in the first part of the verse, it assumes that you know that that's what it's talking about. Or at least it assumes that you now know that they have to have been going on in the first three and a half uh, years. And anyway, in any case, that's the absolute sure thing that you can take away from this. If... The Abraham Accords is the fulfillment or partial fulfillment or whatever of the first part of Daniel 9.27, then then whatever your start date for that is has to be less than three and a half years from then. Daily sacrifices not only have to begin on the Temple Mount, which would of course start a world war immediately. So it doesn't seem likely that they're going to build a sanctuary, let alone a temple or, or a sanctuary, whatever, and then begin sacrificing the daily sacrifice, a twice daily sacrifice on the Temple Mount in that political climate. It's not likely. And this is where I'll say, look, if that happens, then I'm going to, you know, at least say, hey, it's looking a lot more likely that it could be. Um, I think what I'm trying to say here is that Everybody should admit that Daniel, and should be humble enough to admit that the first part of Daniel 9.27 is vague, even though I'm about to go into a, a theory on it that I think I can reasonably argue. I will also say that we have one verse about this in the Bible, and it is vague. And therefore, if you're not humble enough, um, you're going to probably get it wrong. And you have to be okay with being proved wrong. And in this case, you are proved wrong by sacrifices not occurring on the Temple Mount in the next three and a half years. So, yes, it's going to take a while for us to be absolutely sure. I want to talk about one more kind of thing that you can use to calibrate whether or not uh, the Abraham Accords are a fulfillment of Daniel 9, uh, 27, is in Daniel eleven forty through 45 is the wars that the Antichrist fights. And we know the Antichrist is a man of war. We know that for multiple reasons. It says that uh, uh, he is a man of war. Uh, it says that he worships a god of fortresses. He talks about uh, how they worship him, saying, who can make war with the beast? Uh, he's described in many places as conquering and, and so on and so forth. He's almost certainly... Anyway, we could go on. I think most of you would agree with that. And here is a picture of the wars in Daniel 11. And this is well past the time when everybody agrees now we are talking about uh, the Antichrist. Usually that transition, everybody agrees, at least happens at, at Daniel 11.36. So we're well into the Antichrist uh, portion at this point in Daniel 11. And let's just look at some of these wars. And I would argue and have argued in my podcast and other places that this war almost certainly begins the moment of the covenant being made. Uh, now, that is somewhat conjecture. I could go through my points, but, uh, why I think that it, it's a really good argument. Uh, but I will say it is um, just that. It's just an argument. It's just a personal opinion at this point. Nevertheless, this war will happen, and I believe it has to happen earlier than later in the Antichrist career says, at the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen with many ships, and he shall enter the countries and overwhelm them and pass through. He shall also enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. And he shall have the power over treasures of gold and silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall follow at his heels, but news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. And he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and no one will help him. Now these are martial. There is no... Th this is... This is a war, a series of conquests that the Antichrist embarks on. Um, and there is not a way out of this, I, th I think. These are specific nations that make up 
uh, what's sometimes called Greater Israel, uh, Assyria and Egypt, and uh, you know Edom and Moab and all these countries are a part of what was originally given to to Abraham, but the, but Israel never really fully acquired. But that's neither here nor there. My point is this is real war, and this is a necessary thing that we must see the Antichrist do early in his career. I would submit if the Abraham Accords was the beginning of the 70th week, then this should be happening certainly in the next three and a half years. Um, now, what I think a lot of the diehards here that say, well, this is definitely, it's definitely Trump, it's definitely Jared Kushner, or definitely Benjamin Netanyahu, they're going to have to make this happen with those guys. And again, where they're going to, since they're probably not going to get Daniel uh, uh, Donald Trump riding on a, uh, uh, you know, and <laughs> defeating these land these lands in battle, they'll probably make up something that it was. Oh, really? If you look at it this way and kind of tilt your head, he sort of did take Egypt's gold, you know, or something like that. And maybe, maybe, but I don't consider this ambiguous at all. This is talking about a series of conquests that the Antichrist fights. One of the greatest unambiguous signs we are given to identify the Antichrist is here in Daniel 11, 40 through 45. And if you don't take this to mean what it clearly says to mean, because the rest of this passage in Daniel 11 was interpreted very literally as conquests in the same way this should be interpreted. Anyway, so that's just another one of those things before we move on to uh, my, my theory of what Daniel 927 is talking about. So, as I said, I believe that what this is referring to is making a firm covenant or confirming a covenant or confirming the covenant. I believe this is talking about the inauguration of what would be the third temple. So we got the temple, second temple. So this is the third temple, what, what you might call the Antichrist temple. There will be a fourth temple, sometimes called Ezekiel's temple. Uh, which will be in the millennium. But this one is pretty much here just for the Antichrist. And I'll call it the third temple from here on out. So it is, I believe, the confirming of the Mosaic Covenant that would be the explicit thing that would would be happening if you allowed Israel to 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 start the daily sacrifice again. Again, the point of this is that the daily sacrifice is a crucial uh, aspect, maybe the only real aspect that's needed uh, to atone for sin within the Mosaic Covenant. There's individual sacrifices, but then there's the corporate daily sacrifice that essentially is representative of Israel's right relationship with God. There's a covenant surrounding the daily sacrifice that as long as that's going on, that God will dwell and watch over his people. There's all this language around the, da the daily sacrifice specifically that is just very hard to get around in some kind of flowery, yes, we still have a covenant, but you don't have the daily sacrifice. But of course, so number one, the daily sacrifice is incredibly important. The number two thing is that obviously the reason it hasn't happened is because it would spark a world war. Um, the Dome of the Rock is on the Temple Mount currently. The Temple Mount is a very contentious place. It's very difficult to, to walk on there if you are a Jew at all. Certainly you can't be praying on there if you're a Jew, and it's very restricted, especially for Jews. Other people can go up there very heavily restricted. You certainly can't go in the Dome of the Rock or whatever. There is no conceivable way right now that you could sacrifice uh, whatever it would end up being, 22,000 lambs and 11,000 uh, oxen and all the grain offerings, that's just not going to happen in the current situation. Now, that's a, a reference to something we'll get into in a minute. But there are a lot of lambs and oxen that would need to be sacrificed in, the, in a current daily sacrifice situation. And it would be seen as... Um, it would be seen as the beginning of the end times to the Islamic world with the way that they have their uh, uh, eschatology structured. So if you did do that, if you were, let's say, Israel, and you said, okay, we need to do this in order to be under the covenant. We have to have this covenant, and the only way we're going to be able to do that is through uh, daily sacrifice, and the only way we're going to be able to do that is just to say, whatever, come what may, 
we are going to start sacrifices here. And I think that's what's being, um, I think that's why they say of the Antichrist, uh, they say the people, let's pull it up here. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So the worshipers of the beast, one of the things that they worship him for, or at least one of the things that they highly uh, look up to him because of, is because who is able to make war with him? We worship him because who is able to make war with him? Now, in other places, it talks about the Antichrist being empowered by the dragon, Satan, uh, to conquer. Uh, it says, as I mentioned before, he has a god of of, uh, of fortresses, which sounds like a martial term. Certainly, we saw in that Daniel 11 passage that he was able to utterly destroy, even though they were coming at him, Assyria and Egypt attacked him, he just obliterated them like they were nothing. So he has something, whether that's technological or supernatural or a little bit of both or whatever, the Antichrist is a man of war, not a man of peace. That's what the Bible says. He is a man of war. And he absolutely destroys those who attack him. I believe that he says to them, hey, go ahead and start the sacrifices. Start your, your covenant, uh, if you will. Um, I will protect you. Who can make war with me? They're going to come after you. Sure, they have to. It's essentially a part of their religion. To, to, they're going to have some guy over here saying, start the sacrifice in the Temple Mount. That's the end times to them. They're going to come at you. Everybody's going to come at you. And they do. Assyria, what is modern day Iraq, Iran, and a little bit of Turkey, and a little bit of uh, you know some of the other countries in that north region there, they're going to come down on Israel along with Egypt. It's a two-flanked attack, or it could be, I don't know, Daniel 11 doesn't make it clear if they attack at the same time or not. But whatever happens, they're attacking the Antichrist and he defeats them. I believe that they attack him because of that first event, the starting of the daily sacrifices in Daniel 9.27. The, the reason I'm doing this, nothing I've said right now is, is particularly new to anybody that's been listening to uh, my podcast for a while. And if anybody has stuck with me this far, uh, I'm amazed. But one of the things I was trying to do because of all this talk of, of the Abraham Accords is to try to get into this general phrase here and just see if there's anything I could find in the Bible that would inform what this might look like, if that theory was correct, right? If the theory is that the Antichrist will allow for a temple to be built, he will allow for the sacrifices to begin, and that the beginning of this is the beginning of the daily sacrifice. It ends three and a half years later, but it begins right here at this moment. It, and it ends after a series of wars, uh, which he is incredibly victorious in. I believe, uh, just to wrap that up in a bow, I believe that at the end of Daniel 11, he gets killed right before the midpoint. Um, then, as Revelation tells us, he gets a mortal wound that's healed. He resurrects from the dead, seemingly. Uh, if that's exactly what's happening, I'm not sure. It seems to suggest that he is resurrecting from the dead. I believe it's God that does that. In First Thess or Second Thessalonians 2, I believe it makes that clear that it's a strong delusion that God's sends on people so that they will believe the lie. The lie specifically is that um, he is the Antichrist. That's the moment at that midpoint that he sits in the temple, declares himself to be God after his resurrection. And that ties that up in a, in a bow. And of course, the great GT, great tribulation begins after that. And then we have uh, the persecution and everything that follows. And then, of course, the day of the Lord. <clears throat> um, anyway, let's rewind the tape a little bit. What I started to look at was dedications of the temples in uh, the Bible. And there are two occasions, uh, well, it's the same occasion, talked about twice, one in 2 Chronicles 5 and one in 1 Kings, in which the dedication of the temple happened. So, of course, uh, God uh, allowed David, King David, to build the temple, the very first temple Oh, well, he didn't allow David to build it. He allowed D David to gather materials to build the temple. But the actual construction of the temple was left to David's son, Solomon, to do. And Solomon spent uh, his career essentially constructing the temple with all the materials that uh, David had acquired. And it culminates in a great prayer of Solomon. Uh, and the beginning of the day, well, it starts off with a 
a, a big sort of celebratory sacrifice, which then begins uh, the daily sacrificial system and all the other subsequent sacrifices that would happen as a normal course of uh, the, the, the sacrifices outlined in, uh, in uh, Exodus and uh, Leviticus and the rest of it. But it's really interesting because if you look at what's happening in the dedication of this temple, it is a new covenant being made with Solomon's prayer of dedication. And it's a really interesting prayer of dedication right before the beginning of the sacrificial system. So what I'm going to suggest to you is that while I don't consider this a prefiguration or any kind of thing like that, I'm just saying that this would be the kind of expected thing to happen. And I, I guarantee you, if, if this happens in, 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 before the Lord actually returns or, or anything like that, this is sort of the template that the Jewish people would look to for a dedication of a temple. This is the go-to place. Where do you go to, how are we going to uh, work this dedication ceremony of the new temple? The sacrifices are about to start again. Happy day. Uh, where do we go to figure out how to do that? This is where you turn. And so I want to read Solomon's prayer of dedication. You could get into this whole scene that happens here. The ark being brought into the temple. Again, this is Second Chronicles. Uh, and we're going to go through that. And we're going to go through a very interesting thing that happens at the end of this prayer as well. Um, so the Ark of the Covenant is a big part of this too. I mean, that's where I have some of these highlighted of covenant as covenant is mostly because of the Ark of the Covenant, and which is the symbolic of the Mosaic Covenant, obviously, which is what this is all about. And then, of course, a, a couple different covenants also happening here as well. One is a covenant that he made with David in which um, that he promised David that as long as the temple, I, we'll see what exactly the wording of it is, but basically the lineage of kings would extend, I think, through the Messiah or basically something like that. The, something about the lineage of kings was part of a covenant made with David. But though it is not expressly mentioned as a covenant here, Solomon, through his prayer, comes up with an entirely new covenant that God explicitly agrees to a entire new set of essentially rules that Solomon boldly asked for. And God says, okay, I'll do all this stuff that you asked me to do, but you got to do this stuff. You got to do what you said. And if you don't do what you said, then I'm not going to do what you asked. Okay. So there's a lot to read here. I'm going to read from the second Chronicles portion because it's a little more, um, it's a little less dry than the, uh, than the first Kings one. Uh, Solomon had made a bronze platform five cubits long, five cubits wide, three cubits high, and had set in it the court, and he stood in it. He knelt on his knees in the presence of the whole assembly of Israel and spread out his hands towards heaven. He said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or on earth, keeping covenant and steadfast love with your servant who walked before you with all their heart. You have uh, kept... For your servant, my father David, what you pronounced to him, indeed you promised with your mouth that this day and this day have fulfilled with your hand. Therefore, O Lord God of Israel, keep your uh, servant, my father David, uh, keep, keep for your servant, my father David, that which you promised him, saying, There shall never fail you a successor before me to sit on the throne of Israel, if your children keep to their way to walk in my law as you have walked before me. Therefore, Lord God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you promised to your servant David. But will God indeed reside with mortals on earth? Even heaven in the highest and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. Have regard to your servant's prayer and his plea, O Lord, God, o Lord my God, heeding the cry and the prayer that your servant prays to you. May your eyes be open day and night toward this house the place where you promised to set your name. And may you heed the prayer that your servant prays toward this place and hear the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when you pray towards this place. May you hear the heavens, the heaven, your dwelling place here and forgive. If someone sins against another and is required to take an oath and comes and swears before your altar in this house, may you hear from heaven and act and judge your servants, repaying the guilty by bringing their contact, conduct on their own head and vindicating those who are in the right by rewarding them in accordance with their righteousness. When your people Israel, having sinned against you, are defeated before an enemy and turn against you, confess your name, pray... Or, 
and turn against you, confess your name, pray and plead with you in this house. May you hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them again to the land that you gave them and to their ancestors. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against you and they pray towards this place, confess your name and turn from their sin because you punish them. May you hear in heaven, forgive their sin, the sin of your servants, your people Israel, when you teach them the good way in which they should walk and send down rain upon your land, which you have given to your people as an inheritance. If there is famine in the land, if there is plague, blight, mildew, locusts, or caterpillar, if their enemies besiege them in any of their settlements of the lands, whatever suffering, whatever sickness there is, whatever prayer, whatever plea from any individual or from all your people Israel, all knowing their own suffering and their own sorrows so that they stretch out their hand toward this house. May you hear from heaven in your dwelling place, forgive and render to whose heart you know according to all their ways, for you know the the human heart. Thus may they fear you and walk in your ways all the days that they live in the land and that you gave that you gave to our ancestors. Likewise, when foreigners who are not of your people Israel come from a distant land because of your great name and your and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when they come and pray towards this house, may you hear from heaven in your dwelling place and do whatever the foreigner asks of you in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you and to do your people and do as do your people Israel and that they may know that your name has been invoked on this house that I have built. If your people go out to battle against their enemies by whatever way you shall send them, and they pray to you towards the city that you have chosen and the house that I have built for your name, then hear from heaven their prayer and plea and maintain their cause. If they sin against you, for there is no no one who does not sin, and you are angry with them and give them to an enemy so that they are carried away captive to a land far or near, Then if they come to their senses in the land to which they have been taken captive and repent and plead with you in the land of their captivity, saying, We have sinned, we have done wrong, we have acted wickedly. If they repent with all their heart and soul in the the land of captivity to which they were taken captive and pray towards this land, which you gave to their ancestors, the city you have chosen and the house what I have built for, for your name, then hear from heaven your dwelling place their prayer and plea and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have uh, sinned against you. Now, O God, let your eyes be open and your ears attentive to the prayer from this place. And then it's sort of a, a closing psalm. Now rise up, O Lord God, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Let the priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation, and let your faithful rejoice in your goodness. O Lord God, do not reject your anointed one. Remember your steadfast love for your servant David. When Solomon had ended his prayer, Fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the house of the Lord because of the glory of the Lord filled the, the whole house. And when the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down on the pavement with their faces to the ground and worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his steadfast, steadfast love endures forever." Then the king and all the people who offered sacrifices before the Lord, King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 oxen, 120,000 sheep. So the king uh, and all the people dedicated the house to the God, the priest, blah, 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 blah. It's a lot to, to go through there. But a couple takeaways I want to make there is that I think that that's the dedication of the temple by Solomon when it was built is unambiguously a covenant. Oh, I should let's, we got to go to the most important part that God, obviously fire coming down from heaven and consuming the sacrifices is probably proof enough that God had accepted Solomon, but we are actually given a, a, a follow-up here. And verse, it says, uh, verse 12 of the next chapter, it says, then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. 
As for you, if you walk before me as your father David walked, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and ordinances, then I will establish your royal throne as the covenant I made with your father David, saying you shall never lack a successor to rule over Israel. So he goes through talking to Solomon specifically, but the, the important part is there that God agrees with this and, and confirms, if you will, and not to make the, the literary illusion there, but he does confirm the, the covenant that Solomon asked for in his corporate prayer to the people in the dedication of the temple ceremony. It is not generally agreed. I think maybe this is why people miss this. They talk about covenants with Noah, the Abrahamic covenant, uh, the Davidic covenant, uh, you know, certainly the Mosaic covenant and uh, all kinds of different covenants that God makes with people in the Bible. But this is certainly a covenant. This is the Solomaic covenant, if there ever was one. This is a number of very specific things that Solomon asks for God to do, an if-then kind of series of statements that God agrees to do. The takeaways I want to mention here are a couple things, especially in the end times context. And again, I don't think this is a prefiguration of the end times or anything like that. I just think this is going to be a template that people are going to look back on and say, this is what a dedication of the temple will need to look like. It is interesting, of course, that the false prophet in the end times uh, calls fire down from heaven. Here, here he's, uh, he exercises all the authority of the first beast in the presence. And so that's the Antichrist. The false prophet exercises the authority of the Antichrist in his presence and causes the earth and dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that it even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in sight of men and deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs in which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Now, uh, in the Bible, uh, calling fire down from heaven is something that Elijah does. He does it three different times, I think exactly three times. I could be wrong about that, but a number of times. And so it's, it's an Elijah-specific thing. Of course, we know that Elijah is supposed to come before the great day of the Lord. Uh, it says in Malachi. And of course, that is a very Jewish-centric concept, part of the, the, the prayer uh, the great prayer of uh, Messianic prayer said, to cl- concluding every Sabbath or whatever, is you know that Elijah would come back and, and lead the way to the Messiah or whatever. So I think the idea that fire coming down from heaven in the false prophet, who I think will pretend to be Elijah, but that it's not, again, it's just a personal uh, feeling based on some things like this, that he is calling fire down from heaven, and the anticipation of Elijah in, in, in Messianic context. Um So that's one thing. The other thing I want to point out is back in our verse in Daniel 9, 27, that he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, I've looked at these words, many, covenant, confirm. (laughs) I've looked at every one of these words that are a part of this, tried to find some, some aspect in the concordances or other sorts of indication that that this is talking about something else, but a lot of these words are just very general. And for example, many, it just means many. And there's no context that I can find that's specific to anything else. So, so, you know, the question is, what, what is the many here? You know, and in the Hal Lindsey version, the many is Israel. And I guess I tend to agree with that. I mean, because the covenant is being made with Israel, but it doesn't say Israel. It says many. And I think that might be an important distinction. Of course, we know the Antichrist will make his covenant with Israel. I believe that's a pretty guaranteed thing, especially if it does have anything to do with the Mosaic Covenant. It's very Israel-specific. But notice here something that Solomon did in the dedication of the temple. He talks about the nations. For the foreigners who are not of your people, Israel, come from a distant land because of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When they come and pray towards this house, may you hear from heaven from your dwelling place and do whatever the foreigners ask of you. That is an incredible thing for Solomon to come out and know. There's not a lot of other precursor to that in the Old Testament. Solomon kind of comes out of nowhere with this. I mean, there is some... So, so this is pre-prophets, right? This is pre-Isaiah and some others start to bring in this messianic idea that in the, what we would call the millennium, there is a place for the foreigner. That, and it's all, all usually in the context of the temple as well. That is to say, in the millennium, 
the foreigners will go up to Israel to worship at the temple. Um, Jesus rules with a rod of iron. If they don't come up to the temple, he causes rain not to come on them. There's a very, it's a very vivid picture of what's happening in the millennium. But I'm just trying to point out that those were later in the prophets that they started to talk about the fact that the nations were going to be involved in this. And I could be wrong. I might be missing something. Uh, but I'm pretty sure by Solomon, there wasn't a lot of talk that the foreigners were going to be involved. And yet, in this covenant, that, uh, that, that this prayer, covenantal prayer that, that Solomon's making here at the dedication of the temple, he brings the foreigners up and says, do whatever they say if they pray to this temple. This temple is significant with regard to the foreigners, and it essentially established the court of the Gentiles. Uh, and that whole sort of system was basically established here. So again, if this is kind of a picture of what you would look at in that context of, of inaugurating the temple. I believe that Daniel 9, and I'm going to get into this now, I think, is, and I again, I talked about this in a recent podcast, and I'm not going to go through that whole thing about this being about temples. I'll just appeal to you this way with Daniel 9. The context, of course, is Daniel in captivity. Uh, ha- known, he knows that, Dan- that the prophet Jeremiah before him has said that they were going to be in captivity for, for uh, uh, 70 years. So he knows that it's going to come to an end. He also uh, is praying for basically the establishment of the temple again. This is very temple specific, this prayer that Daniel prays before he even gets this vision. And again, that's because of the shock to the system in the Jewish mind to not have the temple anymore and to therefore not have that atonement that comes from the daily sacrifice. So a lot of the focus of Daniel was about not just, hey, we're in captivity, please get us out of captivity or or whatever. He's praying specifically about the temple and even more specifically about uh, the the sanctuary, the, the, the very act of, of sacrifices going on in the temple. He, he mentions either the sanctuary or sacrifices and many times in Daniel chapter 9. Daniel 9.16, 9.17, 9.20, 9.21, 9.24, and 9.27 all make some reference to the Holy of Holies, the, the, the sacrificial system. Daniel 9 is about sacrifices and when will they start again? And I can say the last two verses, as we sort of touched on, is the reason why there's a huge gap between Daniel 9, 26 and 27 temporally, that is 2,000 years, is because one of them, Daniel 9, 26, ends with the, with the sanctuary in the city being completely destroyed. And Daniel 9, 27 begins with one being inaugurated. That's why the clock starts again. That's why 70 weeks were determined for your people in your holy city it starts again with that, uh, with that uh, uh, starting of the sacrifices. And so I'm just appealing. I'm going to just pick out some things here, Daniel 16 and 17 and 20 and 21. O Lord, according to thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury turn, be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, um, because of your sins and for your iniquities and fathers uh, of our fathers. Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach uh, to all that are about us. Now, therefore, O God, hear the prayer of thy servant and thy supplications and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. Again, I just want to point out here that Daniel, even before we get to the 70 weeks prophecy, is praying about the sanctuary, which is desolate, not just the temple, not just the city, but almost specifically this sanctuary, which is desolate, that is to say, is not having sacrifices on it. So when I say in Daniel 9, 27, that he confirms the covenant with one week, and in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And I'm saying, you should understand the beginning of this, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week to be saying the sacrifices get started then. It's not out of nowhere. This is firmly in context of Daniel 9. Again, all about the sacrifices, which were not going on, which Daniel was praying about. And he gets this picture, probably more than he bargained for, of all these history, the the entire history of this temple and how it will all go about. All right, so I will end this here. I think I got my point across. Uh, Bottom line, though, is that 
I really don't think the Abraham Accords have anything to do with Daniel 9.27. It doesn't fit the context. I really believe that this idea that we were looking for a quote-unquote peace agreement with Israel really is more out of Hal Lindsey's imagination or whoever started that very recently. Uh, it certainly is not a great interpretation of Daniel 9.27. I will say it is a possible interpretation of 9.27. I don't want to say it's an impossible interpretation. It is unlikely, in my opinion, and if it is, we should very quickly see some evidence that uh, it's coming true in uh, in whether in seeing either sacrifices uh, beginning and then ending on the Temple Mount, and then of course the wars of the Antichrist need to happen at some point very very soon as well. So we need to see those things happen if we want the Abraham Accords or any other thing like it to be the fulfillment of Daniel 9.27. But the much more likely interpretation, in my opinion, is the dedication of a new temple in which the daily sacrifice is started uh, but will be uh, stopped at three and a half years later um, as well. Okay, thank you for uh, tuning in. Check out my podcast. Please subscribe to it, BibleProphecyTalk.com. You know, a lot of things are getting shut down these days. I feel like the podcast, the audio podcast, is the last stand. So if you're a podcast listener, please go to the website, BibleProphecyTalk.com. Subscribe to the RSS feed. It's a little more secure than the iTunes link or the Spotify link or whatever, but it is, uh, it's all the, really the same. Also, you can check out my uh, recent uh, movie that uh, just got uh, done producing. It took about a year and a half to, to get done with Alan Kirshner. Check it out. Uh, also a link below to that. Okay, thank you for your time, and we will see you soon. Bye-bye.